This is possibly the most ignored problem when it comes to the coverage regarding SpaceX's Starship, and so we're gonna spend the next few minutes analyzing this hurdle that SpaceX needs to overcome in order to get to Mars, and suggest solutions in future videos that all other space agencies, companies, or entities need to or are already exploring in order to secure humanity's place amongst the stars. Hi, I'm Ohms and welcome to Ohms Law. Today's analysis will be based on NASA and the Canadian Space Agency's research and experiments and I've left links for all of the information discussed today in the description below. Before I start this series about Starship and I've left links to those videos as well, I was a huge advocate for colonizing Mars. The prospects are truly limitless and unimaginable. However, deep down, I always felt that something was wrong with this whole strategy. I always knew that the gravity problem was something very serious, along with a long list of problems such as radiation, confinement, isolation, etc., which we won't have time to go through in this video, but I never actually thought about the consequences of leaving our planet until I watched The Expanse. For those of you unfamiliar with the show, don't worry, I won't be spoiling anything, but the basic premise is that humanity has colonized the solar system and the peoples in it have now been split into three major powers or groups. The United Nations, which includes Earth and Luna, dominates the system with its economical grip, while Mars stands as an advanced military ex-colony with sophisticated technology that can rival the vast force of the UN. The Belt, on the other hand, is a group of independent factions, and a large number of them have allied themselves under the OPA banner, short for the Outer Planets Alliance. Besides the cultural, economical, and linguistic contrasts that these powers have, due to the vastness of space, their major difference is influenced by the environment they live in, mainly the influence of gravity on their bodies. Martians have a stronger build as they spend their whole lives training to survive the planet's weak gravity, taking supplements, medications, or inhibitors in order to maintain bone density and prevent muscle fatigue. Belters, on the other hand, don't have this luxury as they spend their whole lives mining and extracting resources from the asteroid belt for Earth and Mars, being forced to live poor and dangerous lives. They are also taller, with much weaker bone structures due to the zero gravity, and the inner planets exploit this weakness from time to time in the show. So why am I mentioning this science fiction TV series? Well, The Expanse highlights the consequences of gravity and how it can split humanity into different species if it's not dealt with appropriately. Moreover, the show highlights how to deal with gravity in regards to interstellar travel by having the spaceships undergo constant acceleration and thereby simulating different gravitational effects on the craft. A ship would leave to the destination accelerating, then flip towards the opposite end and accelerate in order to lower its speed as it arrives, maintaining gravity throughout most of the journey. One of the ships even spins at some point in the series, and any dangerous maneuvers in battles or missions will surely stroke you out or get you killed or injured in the most horrific ways. Watching the show really made me consider the gravity problem and what needs to happen with the design of the starship in order to mitigate the effects of gravity as much as possible. With the current design of the starship being this long tubular structure with several decks on the inside similar to a building and the proposed cargo of over a hundred tons with a flight plan of around six months, let's start off by being realistic about the flip and burn maneuver. In regards to cargo, this might work out just fine, but people, even experienced and trained astronauts, won't survive it. We are talking about a trip here that's going to last around two years, and almost half of that has no gravity at all. No one has even been off Earth for that long. Peggy Whitson survived 665 days in space, and that's the accumulation over the course of her entire career. Valery Polyakov is a Russian former cosmonaut who holds the record for the longest single stay in space on board the Mir space station for more than 14 months or 437 days and 18 hours. And those people came back with a laundry list of health complications due to the lack of gravity. What's worse is that we don't even have enough information in regards to a trip that's going to last over 700 days with varying gravitational effects, some of which are extremely wild to say the least, being experienced by the crew. So most of the talking points coming up need to be taken with extreme caution and I ask the audience to imagine that these problems will only increase in complexity and severity as we venture towards the red planet and other places in the solar system. 
SpaceX has definitely redefined the space industry with all of the progress it has put out so far and by providing healthy competition to the otherwise monopolized and stagnant sector. But in regards to gravity, to my knowledge, they've barely dealt with the subject when it comes to people surviving interstellar travel and the suicide dive. NASA, on the other hand, has plenty of experience and data. Scott and Christina were the first American astronauts to spend nearly one year in space on board the space station. In addition, Scott was involved in the unique twin study whereby he participated in several biomedical studies on board the space station. At the same time, his identical twin brother, retired astronaut Mark Kelly, stayed on Earth as a control subject. This was an incredibly important study as it provided valuable data about what happened to Scott physiologically and psychologically as compared to his brother Mark. And it is the strongest evidence that we have so far in regards to the difficulties of living in a zero-g environment. So we're going to base our assumptions and the arguments made in this video and future ones on that. Real data provided by experienced scientists. So what exactly happens to your body in space and what are the risks? And are the risks the same for astronauts who spend six months on the space station as those who may be away on a Mars mission for years? Let me start off with the latter question since it's simpler and it's obviously no. NASA is still researching risks for Mars missions and it has grouped them into five human flight hazards related to the stressors they place on the body. These are known as RIDGE, short for space radiation, isolation and confinement, distance from Earth, gravity fields, and hostile closed environments. For today, we're just gonna stick with the distance from Earth and truly describe the numbers we are dealing with. As a quick refresher, the space station orbits 240 miles or 386 kilometers above the Earth. The moon is a thousand times farther from Earth than the space station. You can basically fit all the planets in that space, by the way. In contrast, Mars is on average 140 million miles or 225 million kilometers from Earth, almost another 500 times greater than the distance between Earth and the moon. So if the starship was the size of an atom traveling from Earth, Mars would be almost three starships away. And this causes a communication delay of up to 20 minutes one way. To elaborate, communication is usually done via radio signals which travel at the speed of light. So it takes light about 8 minutes to travel from the sun to the earth. The communication with Mars will be 2 or 3 times that. So astronauts must be able to solve problems and identify solutions as a team without help from earth. Any accident or incident must be trained for and the crew must improvise and work together in order to survive. This isn't like traveling on an airliner whereby air traffic control can guide the craft to safety or people can come to the rescue. For the first couple of missions, the crew are basically on their own, traveling in the void for months at a time. The distances are mind-boggling and I hope viewers take this into account as we move through this series. To this day, NASA has been using human spaceflight experience on the space station to figure out what types of medical events happen in space over time and what types of skills, procedures, equipment and supplies are needed to survive future missions to Mars. Space station astronauts already receive medical training before and during space missions that teach them how to respond to health problems as they arise. For example, astronauts learn how to use onboard space station equipment to produce an intravenous solution from purified water, which can be used for medical administration. Crew members also perform ultrasound scans on each other to monitor organ health. If one crew member gets sick during the mission, crews are ready to perform laboratory testing to help make the right diagnosis and guide treatment. NASA is working on developing a medical data architecture which could use artificial intelligence and machine learning to further help diagnose and treat various illnesses. Virtual assistants could also come into play here, helping crews identify and respond to spaceflight anomalies. Additionally, the agency is studying and improving food formulation, processing, packaging, and preservation systems to ensure their nutrients remain stable and the food remains acceptable for years. They're also doing a lot of research in terms of the space-resilient medications and packaging systems that preserve the integrity of pharmaceuticals for long-duration missions. Distance really plays a huge part here in understanding the journey to Mars and in effect the gravity problem. 
Without an established transportation system capable of responding to the crewed vessel in the case of an emergency, this makes the task orders of magnitude more difficult than the moon missions, and those were deadly and complicated to say the least. On Apollo 13, for example, three astronauts almost lost their lives getting to the moon and back, and it took the combined effort of everyone involved in order to get them back to Earth. They barely made it back home a couple of days later. Any accident on the way to Mars, such as a loss of propellant, control of the craft or navigation, air, water, or any medical emergency that needs gravity or assistance from Earth, is at best weeks away and at worst years. The spaceship would be traveling at ridiculous speeds, so stopping in mid-flight is literally impossible, and with the suicide dive being the current plan, even orbital insertion or gravity assist to return to Earth would be also impossible, as the ship won't even have enough propellant left to insert itself in Earth's orbit or to land on the ground. SpaceX needs to redesign the interplanetary transport system by either shortening the time it takes to get there by introducing the thermal nuclear engine to one of their starships, a solution I will discuss in a later video after we've analyzed the gravitational effects, or spin the starship using the centripetal forces as a method of achieving gravity, or preferably do both. And I'll see you guys next time and we'll continue this analysis by finally diving into the various gravitational effects experienced along the journey. Let me know what you guys think as usual and subscribe to the channel if you want to follow up on the series. And as always, thank you for watching.